Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. You know, it's really not an exaggeration to say that humanity is on a path to disaster. And that's because human emissions of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases are warming our planet, shifting our climate, and increasing climate disasters. And those changes are happening already. This year, the monsoon in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh killed or displaced thousands of people. And that is a monsoon that was made worse by a warmer ocean from climate change. And this summer, in the United States, we had a heat wave that broke temperature records for some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded in places in California saw 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we decide, we decide how much climate change we are going to get by exactly how much greenhouse gases we release into the atmosphere. And so we spend a lot of time talking about greenhouse gas emissions and caps on those emissions, and we debate how we are going to achieve those emissions caps. But I'm here to tell you this evening that there is another side to climate change, in addition to stopping climate change, that you're not hearing much about, not nearly as much as you should be hearing about. And this other side of climate change is going to keep us busy for decades, figuring out how to do it and putting it into action. The word for this other side of climate change is adaptation. Adaptation are all the things, the steps, the actions that we're going to take to live with climate change. Even if we hit the brakes on greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to have to find ways to live with this new climate that we have created. Now imagine, if you woke up tomorrow and 100% of the world's population was suffering from some serious chronic disease. What would we do? We would have world awareness campaigns. We would have benefit concerts. We would invest in research for a cure and ways of living, making life more manageable in the face of this disease. That's actually how we can think about adaptation. Adaptation is about living the best life we can in the face of a chronic disease. The problem is we really don't have very many treatments for this chronic disease. And at the same time, billions of people are suffering from it. And that gap is worth a whole heck of a lot of benefit concerts. Now, if we're going to treat this chronic disease called climate change, we have to have some idea of how much of the disease we are actually facing, how bad climate change could get. If we were to stop emitting greenhouse gases right now, we would have a world that is about three degrees Fahrenheit than it, warmer than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In fact, we've already warmed our planet about two degrees Fahrenheit, and that warming is what's causing our heat waves, these droughts and storms, and warming our winters. In cold states like Minnesota, we're actually warming faster than other parts of the United States. Our winters have warmed more than five degrees Fahrenheit in the time since I was born, and I am not that much older than I look. <laughs> five degrees of warming in Minnesota winters so far. But this disease of climate change could get a lot worse. This figure shows you what the world will be like if we continue on our current path of greenhouse gas emissions. This is a world that's about six and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it should be within 100 years. Over land, it will be nine or 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And much of that warming occurs toward the North Pole. And this is just a snapshot in time. 
Warming continues past 2100. In this warmer world, Minnesota would have 30 days each year over 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So think about that. It's like having our hottest days occur every day for the month of August, every year. Right now, we have about 10 days over 90 each year. And that's unpleasant. Hot summers are definitely unpleasant for people. But that amount of warming, that 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit of warming, would eliminate the habitat for some plants and animals. You know, that's, that's why we talk about the polar bear. The polar bear is the climate change poster child. It's the poster child, believe it or not, <clears throat> not because it's cute or ferocious or fuzzy or photographs well. <laughs> it's actually the poster child because in that 6.5 degree warmer world, there's no polar ice and there's no place for the polar bear to go. Biologists think that under that 6.5 degree warmer world, 900,000 species could face extinction like the polar bear. Within 100 years, in fact. 900,000 species. And that doesn't count species that might decline without going extinct or stress to habitats or ecosystems. So the amount of warming that I just showed you is actually similar. In the, it's a similar difference between the world we have today and the world that the climate that we had at the end of the last ice age. So 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit is the difference between our climate and a mile of ice over our heads. In the coming out of the last ice age, that took that climate change took thousands of years. This climate change will take hundreds. This climate change is also caused by people, but here's the most important thing. People will be here to experience the consequences. So if we are going to live successfully through climate change, we should stay away from 6.5 degrees. Now, despite all of the debate and the discussion about climate change, we actually know very well. We know the what, the how, the where, the when, about how to stop it. In fact, stopping climate change is really very simple. All we need is an economic revolution. We need clean electricity. We need clean transportation. And we also need sustainable agriculture. But we know exactly what technologies are necessary for that, and we have the knowledge to get it done. Now, we don't necessarily have the political will to do so. And of course, there are problems with cost and with financing, but we know exactly what to do. We also know the scale of the problem. We know that we have already released three quarters of the 3,700 gigatons of CO2 that we could ever release to the atmosphere if we wanted to avoid catastrophic warming. But adaptation, living with climate change, it doesn't have that clarity. We do not have a toolbox of technologies ready to go. We don't know even how much adaptation we need and how or where to deploy it. And that is exactly why you should be hearing much more about climate change adaptation. Because we need to figure out that math. We need to design the plans and we need to, to craft the strategies that we're going to deploy everywhere around the world. In fact, how we live with climate change will define the rest of our lives. Now, how does a biologist, myself, I'm a biologist, why am I here talking about this other side of climate change? How did I get to be interested in adaptation? I got there by studying butterflies, and specifically this creature, 
This is the bay checker spot butterfly. It lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's an endangered species. And at one time, one of the healthiest populations of this butterfly lived at a place called the Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve. But the number of butterflies at Jasper Ridge declined from thousands of individuals all the way down to zero. In hot and dry years happening in sequence were the final nail in the checker spot coffin, and the butterfly went extinct. Every year, these butterflies are in a race against time and they feed on a host plant that dries up each summer. But one thing that I found as a young scientist is that there's another less common food plant that lasts a little bit longer each summer. And we discovered that if the butterfly eats this less common but longer lasting plant, it does better under extreme years. So for us, this was an aha moment That is a possible adaptation strategy. It is possible to manipulate the habitat of this butterfly by encouraging that longer-lasting plant as a method of making it a little less sensitive to climate extremes, an adaptation strategy. This was my first glimpse at a, at a at a way of manipulating conditions to make things a bit better. That butterfly is one small example of a large type of adaptation, manipulating local conditions to reduce the effects of climate change. But that strategy might not be enough. If the climate change is too fast or too much, we might need additional strategies. So let me introduce you to another butterfly. This is the Carner blue butterfly. It's also an endangered species. It lives on these black dots that are scattered across the Great Lakes states and in the Northeast. But the climate preferred by the Carner blue butterfly is on the move. The conditions at these black dots are headed north. And through the coming decades, the climate suitable for the Carner will be in these green areas. And by the 2080, the distance between the black dots and the green shading will be three to 400 miles. And that is a really long way for a little butterfly to fly. If we don't help the Carner keep up with that changing climate, if we don't help it move hundreds of miles, we could lose it entirely. So that is another possible adaptation strategy, helping things move. How do we help things move? We could build pathways and corridors that make the landscape more permeable to natural migration. We can also help carry things to where they need to be. That's something called assisted migration. Humans can carry a little butterfly a lot farther and faster than it can move on its own. We might have to help things over a barrier, like the San Francisco Bay for the endangered uh, rodent uh, in this Boston Globe cartoon. But butterflies and other creatures are just part of climate change adaptation. We have to help people, too. And like the Carner Blue Butterfly, people can be stranded by climate change. In fact, we already see people moving away from areas that are experiencing climate stress. In 2015, half a million people crossed the Mediterranean to southern Europe, and thousands perished along the way. The flow of refugees from Africa and the Middle East could grow to tens of millions within the coming decades due to crop failures and water shortages caused by climate change. And those numbers, tens of millions, are very, very scary. But international migration can reduce the vulnerability of people to climate change. In fact, if you take recent data 
um, over the last five years, migration data of people, and you compare that to a measure of vulnerability to climate change, you actually find that recent migration reduced the risk of climate change to people by 15%. So just like movement for the Carner blue butterfly, human migration can be an effective strategy, effective adaptation strategy too, if it's managed well, handled well, of course. Now, which strategy is best? Managing a habitat, facilitating migration, or any other strategy is, depends on the situation. It depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you are trying to protect or save. Like medication that you would take for a disease, adaptation will have side effects. When you take medication, you take it when the benefits are high and the side effects are low. And that's exactly what we should do for adaptation, too. Problem is, oftentimes we don't yet know what those side effects are or how large the side effects could be. But there are some cases where those side effects are particularly big and important. Here's one example. If we are to fight against heat waves with air conditioning that's powered by fossil fuels, the side effect, more climate change. That is not a good adaptation strategy. A better strategy would be to use a method that has fewer side effects or maybe even positive side effects. So, for example, we could use green roofs or green space to reduce the effects of extreme heat. Green roofs take the edge off those hot days and they reduce the risk of mortality and other human illnesses, and they reduce energy demand to buildings. So this would count as a smarter adaptation strategy. We are just beginning to scratch the surface of this climate adaptation about what works and what doesn't work and what the side effects would be and how big those side effects could be. Even if we stop climate change now, we will have to adapt everywhere around the world. And the more climate change we allow, the more adaptation we'll need. Recent UN estimates suggest that adaptation could cost $500 billion every year by 2050. That's billion with a B. And there are limits to adaptation, of course. Adaptation could be very useful, helpful to some species and to some people, but not all. With large climate change, no there is no adaptation that will save ice for the polar bear. But this is what I do know. I know that what we need is a new generation of scientists, policymakers, aid workers, and volunteers to tackle adaptation, because those people are needed to put interventions in place everywhere around the world. We need those people to design and build mangroves to protect coastal communities, for example. And my 10-year-old daughter is going to be one of those people because living with climate change will be a persistent feature of her entire life. And though we are just a tiny planet in a massive universe, the changes that we are causing have significant implications and big consequences for people and for nature. And unless we find some other habitable planet, we're going to have to live on this one. And so I want us to continue talking about how to stop climate change. We need to. We have the technologies, and we know how much of that technology is necessary. We need to get that done. We need to get it done now. But we also need to be talking about the other side of climate change, adaptation. It needs much more of our attention. 
Our planet needs a generation of adaptation doctors who will treat the symptoms of this climate change disease. And this new generation won't just be saving butterflies or only aiding refugees. They will be saving life on Earth and billions of lives and livelihoods and millions of plants and animal species are counting on them. Thank you.